Hello, I'm Justin Ameka, and welcome to Henry's Barn. Part of the Albert H. Johnson estate and part of Oberlin since 1885, this structure is a living link to local heritage, local heroes, and local stories. When the barn was no longer in use, the Lorraine County Metro Parks, along with Richard and Kathleen Nord, stepped in to preserve this piece of history. It was deconstructed and moved from its perch on South Professor to a new 11-acre park here in the heart of Lorraine County. When you're inside, you can almost feel what it was like to live in Oberlin in the 19th century. It's easy to imagine the life of its caretaker, Henry Thomas, attending to the carriages or walking under one of the massive timbers to put away his garden tools. This is the story of a former slave's journey to find freedom, a family's impact on their town and both their legacies. This is Henry's barn. In 1885, 20 years after the Civil War came to a close, construction began on the beautiful Johnson Estate at 216 South Professor Street, Oberlin, Ohio. The owners of the home were businessmen Albert H. Johnson and his wife Rebecca, an 1866 graduate of Oberlin College. Always civically minded, Albert H. contributed to the growth and success of the entire town. The Johnson's residence was intended to both reflect the innovative time period and represent the unique character of Oberlin. The structure's design was commissioned to George Horatio Smith, a well-known architect famous for several elegant Cleveland estates on Euclid Avenue's Millionaire's Row, home to giants of industry such as John D. Rockefeller. Later, Smith would go on to build impressive public structures, including the Cleveland Arcade and the Rose Building. The Oberlin Mansion's Queen Anne style and the adjacent barn's Second Empire style revealed the pride and individuality of the time. The interior of the mansion maintained specific areas for both entertaining and for the family to be in private. The servants' quarters were hidden in the back on the first floor. The barn in itself was a unique piece of architecture. It boasted a mansard style roof and timber frame construction. Inside, the open layout and exposed beams made for an impressive structure. When the barn was no longer in use, the Lorraine County Metro Parks, along with Richard and Kathleen Nord, stepped in to preserve this piece of history. When Oberlin College had, had made that contact with us to say, you know, that they had this barn, they had run their gamut on things that they were thinking about. When they offered it up to us, it was a kind of a match made in heaven when Richard said that they would donate the land if we moved the barn here because they wanted to celebrate that history. Within the barn, we're gonna have certain displays from what the old barn was, what it served and how it was used, how it was dismantled, pieces and parts of that as it was dismantled. And this project, what the barn really spoke to, filling those needs in terms of arts and culture. It's a place where people can gather, hear music, see a play, or just rent the facility. What we did with the barn recreation over there is to go in and document everything and make sure that it was uh, documented properly to assess the uh, rotten areas or the damaged areas so that they could be replaced and uh, to make sure that everything was labeled properly so when we took it down that we could actually assemble it back as it was. We're using all the barn siding for the siding on the inside of the building and all the framework. We haven't thrown anything away. We've never had an opportunity to do a project specifically like this. 
we've built buildings, we've built parks, <laughs> um, but to have, I think, everything kind of come together here, I think great, offers us great opportunity. History talks a lot about where we came from and where we're going to, and I think there's a lot to celebrate with that, uh, certainly here in Oberlin and, and part of the Underground Railroad and just a rich, rich, diverse group of, uh, of people who are engaged in that. To be able to share that story is invaluable to this community, and I think the Lorraine County can really benefit from that. Located in Russia Township, Oberlin was a growing college town. In the 1860s, the town had a population of over 2,000 people, including over 400 black residents who worked as laborers and farmers. Many had escaped slavery and relocated to Oberlin to seek freedom, education, and opportunity. Since 1835, decades before slavery was abolished, Oberlin College accepted both students of color and women. The incredible pioneer thinking of this small school gave a picture of what integrated education in America could be. Oberlin was absolutely brimming with revolutionary spirit, and it permeated throughout the community and its residents. From the 1830s up until the time of the Civil War, Oberlin was well known as being a hotbed of abolitionism and one of the few public stations on the Underground Railroad where people could openly talk about it. At their South Professor Street home, the Johnsons employed several servants, including a former African-American slave named Henry R. Thomas. He cared for the entire estate and was a trusted member of the household. Henry was born into slavery in Virginia around 1857 near the banks of the Ohio River. His home of Tyler County was a collection of large orchards and farms that depended on slave labor to produce crops of corn, potatoes, onions, and apples. As a young child, Henry was sold twice. Throughout Henry's early life, the United States was at odds with itself. States in the North and South waged a political war to decide the fate of new territories wishing to enter the Union. Controversial legislation like the Compromise of 1850 and the Kansas-Nebraska Act further divided the nation by introducing popular sovereignty. Each community was required to decide where they stood, for or against slavery. California was annexed as a free state, which infuriated pro-slavery Democrats. The fugitive slave law was toughened, and the northern states erupted in anger. Increasing threats of violence prompted a new political party, the Republicans, to form from anti-slavery Democrats. In the 1860 presidential election, the Republican candidate Abraham Lincoln won the presidency without any support from the South. Just a month after he was elected, states in the South began seceding from the Union. President Lincoln believed that the only way the United States could survive is to remain united. On April 12, 1861, the first battle of the four-year American Civil War began at Fort Sumter with the primary intent to preserve the Union. Since before the foundation of the United States, slavery plagued the Western Hemisphere. By the time the Declaration of Independence was drafted, slaves made up 40% of the people in the southern United States. And by the 1860s, there were almost 4 million slaves in America. Abolitionists advocated immediate emancipation for those in captivity, and they took action to help rid the country of slavery. George and Sarah Jenkins were Quaker abolitionists that operated out of Mount Pleasant, Ohio, near the present-day West Virginia border. They helped to free Henry Thomas and sent him north to find work in the household of their daughter and son-in-law, Rebecca and Albert H. Johnson. Both um, Albert and Rebecca, their parents had come from families that were strongly abolitionist, um, both fairly documented well uh, involved in Underground Railroad activity. So even though they were somewhat um, upper class and maybe a little bit different from other people, that sentiment of equality was very strong in their family as well. The abolitionist movement in America came to a close when slavery was abolished at the end of the Civil War in 1865. Post-Civil War, Albert H. Johnson found prosperity in the town of Oberlin. He never failed to give back to his community and understood that as a leader in Oberlin, he had a civic responsibility to contribute to the town's development. He held many titles throughout his career, 
including president of the First National Bank of Oberlin, superintendent of Sunday School at the Second Church of Oberlin, and Oberlin College trustee. Mr. Johnson was also president of the Oberlin Gas Lighting Company and oversaw the construction of the 1889 gas holding building on South Main Street. When gas-based street lighting systems were converted to electric power, he refocused his business and wired the city of Oberlin with new electric circuits. He was a wealthy man, and it was evident in the home he had built for his family. Albert and his wife Rebecca had two children, Cliff and Albert Mussey. Both were almost adults when they moved into the 24-room mansion on South Professor Street in 1885. While the family enjoyed the newly constructed estate, Henry Thomas utilized his vast skill set to care for the house, barn, carriages, and landscape. As a coachman, he made sure the family's horses were properly cared for, the carriages and harnesses kept clean, and the barn neat. Henry also managed the grounds, which featured a Queen Anne garden. In it grew lilies, poppies, sunflowers, irises, and wild roses. Through his years of work with the Johnson family, Henry Thomas became a reliable and valuable part of the Johnson home and the town of Oberlin. In 1899, tragedy came to the household when Albert H. Johnson was killed in a train accident. His obituary recounts his death. On December 4th, 1899, Albert Johnson and his son, Albert Mussey Johnson, were traveling through Utah and Colorado by train when they were involved in a collision with another locomotive. Their train had stopped on the tracks to tend to a horse caught in a trestle when another train came veering around the corner and crashed into the rear sleeper car of the Johnson's train, the very car where Albert H. Johnson was sleeping. While Albert Mussey Johnson survived the wreck with a severely broken back, the collision killed Albert Sr. Albert Harris Johnson was 61 years old at the time of his tragic death. Just over a decade later, his widow, Rebecca Johnson, sold the Johnson estate to Charles Martin Hall and moved her household to 190 Elm Street. The estate that Albert H. intended to be an ancestral home was too large for Mrs. Johnson alone, and neither of the Johnson heirs wanted to maintain it. Henry Thomas continued to work for Mrs. Johnson at the Elm Street residence. He was especially proud of his garden, where he grew beautiful dahlias that won prizes at the county fair. The neighbors claimed the flowers were so tall he needed a ladder to tend to them. When Mrs. Johnson died in 1915, the Johnson family provided for Henry an income for life and allowed him to stay in the Elm Street home for as long as he was able. In 1945, Henry Thomas died after battling an illness. He was buried behind the Johnson family mausoleum in Westwood Cemetery, Oberlin. His small headstone reads, Henry Thomas, about 85 years old, born a slave, lived with the Johnson family from 1886 until his death in 1945. When Charles Martin Hall purchased the Johnson estate from Rebecca Johnson in 1911, he donated the entire estate to Oberlin College. The house was used at the Oberlin Academy Preparatory School until 1917, when it was converted into a dormitory. The barn behind the main house was used only as a party hall and for storage. In 2016, the Johnson barn was relocated from its original site on South Professor Street to a new home. Now the beauty of the barn is being preserved for generations to come as a multi-purpose venue, and the legacy of Henry Thomas and the Johnsons is being honored for their contribution to the city of Oberlin.